Amen. Very good. Great song. Well, we're in Romans chapter 7. We've been through the first six chapters, and we've a very great doctrinal book by, again, the human writer, Paul, very well-educated Saul, Jewish, under Gamaliel. Remember that Saul was a wasn't just like Jesus' disciples early on were fishermen, you could say uneducated. They, were, they knew how to fish, and the Holy Spirit filled them and used them. But Paul was a very educated Jew that knew the law very well. And you're going to see the word law here in Romans chapter 7 mentioned. Today is that number 7, I guess, chapter 7. It's mentioned seven times here in these first six verses. The message today is the believer, those that have trusted Christ, we're to be free from the law. <laughs> We're free people. I like the idea of a church being free from being under the authority of an outside of the church authority. In other words, a denomination or ecclesiastical group or religion. You know, someone telling the church what to do that's not even a member of the church. And so we are an independent church, autonomous, self-governing. We, we love that. Uh, you, most of the problems you see with religion in the past, a couple of thousand years of Christianity, have been from groups that have tried to control churches from the outside in. It doesn't work that way, amen? God is our leader. Our, the Bible is our, you could say, guidebook. It tells us everything we need to know about life and godliness. And so we are free, and not only free from religious hierarchy, but we're free from the law. And there's a purpose for the law, but it has nothing to do with salvation, it, except that it leads us to see our need for Christ. No one could keep the law. No one could keep the Ten Commandments, all right? The law of Moses and many, many other laws, thousands of things that were added to that by the Jews, the rabbis. And so Jesus came. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. He fulfilled the law. And in Jesus and in salvation, now the law has no power over us because we're freed, we're saved by grace, right? Not by keeping the law. And so Paul, in this great book, this great doctrinal book, especially now in Romans chapter 7, is going to talk about that. He relates, again, if you're a believer today, you've trusted Christ, you've been born again, it's by faith, through grace, free gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, the Old Testament law, we're not saying, forget about that, it's no good. No, it's just not good for salvation. It's good to lead us to Christ. And so these are laws God gave the nation of Israel, of course, to live by, but it couldn't save anyone. The purpose of the law wasn't for salvation, but to show men that we're sinners and we needed a Savior. Amen? So the law of God stands before man, and it stands for something. Something for the lost person and something for us who are saved. There's three lessons, believe it or not, in Romans chapter 7. Today we're going to just do one. So we're going to try to get you out of here by 11 o'clock and keep the service under an hour if we can. Three things we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the two positions of the law to man. Then we're going to look at, uh, next week maybe, the purpose of the law. And then the confessions of a man's struggle. We're going to read in chapter 7. There's some verses here. I don't know about you. Very difficult, uh, Paul writes, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But... Uh, uh, Maybe difficult, especially in the King James Version, to understand. You know, that which I should do, Paul says, I can't do. The things I shouldn't do, that I do. And over and over again, he says these words. Now, if I do that, I would not. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. If you read these things, and you know what I'm talking about, those of you that have read chapter 7, sometimes a little confusing. We're going to try, and hopefully in the third week when we get to that, to make it a little easier to understand. But today, two positions. Number one, the law dominates man and he uses an illustration of a marriage here. All right? And a lot of people quote Romans chapter 7 and other verses in the New Testament, Corinthians about marriage, divorce, remarriage. But this really is the examples given here to show how we're free from the law. Just like a, a person that's married is free from the law of her husband. If, if he dies, death, death makes us free from the law. And so the law dominates us as long as we live. We talked about chapter 6. We are dead with Christ in his, in his crucifixion. We've been crucified with Christ. We're dead to the law. And uh, again, the example he gives. But the law dominates only as long as we live it. That's, look at 7, chapter 7, verse 1. No, you're not, brethren, he said. 
after all these six chapters, for I speak to them that know the law. This is the first of seven times it's mentioned. How the law hath dominion or power over a person or man as long as he's living. For the woman, and here's his example, which hath a husband bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, and we're going to talk about we're dead to the law, right? As, as the husband is dead, she is loosed, she's free from the law of her husband. So then, while her husband liveth, if she was married to another man, she would be called a Mormon, but here <laughs> it mentions an adulteress. If your husband's alive and you're married to somebody else, uh, you can't have two marriages, all right? She has a husband already, and now she's married a second time. What's that? Adultery. That's what he's saying. That's what the Bible says. But if the husband be dead, she's free from that law so that she is not an adulteress anymore because she's freed from the law, though she be married to another man. Well, husband number one is deceased. She's freed. And so he is using an example here of a marriage situation of a widow, a woman, who now is free to remarry. She's not an adulteress. She's not an adulterer anymore. The law applies to the living is what he's trying to say. Forget it for a minute about marriage, all right? It has no bearing, the law, upon a dead person. A dead person, as Paul said in chapter 6, should we continue in sin? How we that are dead, dead to sin, live any longer therein. And a dead person, again, physically alive, but dead to sin, dead to keeping the law, because we can't keep it. It has no power over a dead person. This is important to understand. It seems confusing. It's not. Two positions of the law illustrated here by marriage. <laughs> There's the fact that the law is alive and active in the living. Paul uses this marriage, Old Testament illustration of the law of marriage between a husband and a wife who are living. In verse 2, for the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband. And she is, as long as he liveth. But then in the second part, it shows how the law is dead or inactive when death enters the picture. Death entered the picture for us when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. But if the husband be dead, then she's loose from the law of her husband. The conclusion of this illustration is in verse 3. So then, if while her husband liveth, she's married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, and here's the, the thing you want to see about death to the law, she's free from that law, the law of the husband in that case. She's no longer an adulteress, though she be married to another man. The law condemns the living who violate its demands, if you're trying to keep it. The woman who marries another man while her husband lives broke the law of the marriage. She's an adulteress, but death frees a person. She's free if the husband dies from the law of the husband. We, dead in Christ, are free from the penalty of the law, which is death, eternal separation. It's talking about spiritual death, eternal separation in hell. In conclusion here on point one, when death enters the picture, a person is no longer bound to that law. In the case of a woman, the death of the husband, she's no longer bound to him. In the case of us, we're no longer under the penalty of the law because we died when we trusted Christ. We died in his death. Understand that. <laughs> death frees a person spiritually now from the law, from its demands, the guilt, the condemnation, and the wrath that it brings, the wrath of God. See, people that die without Christ, they have to face, we always say Hebrews 9, 27, pointed unto a man wants to die after that what? The judgment. People without Christ have to face God as a judge. And because of our sin, the original sin that came all the way down from Adam and Eve, our own sins that we commit, sins of commission, and sins of omission, three things. I always say we don't have a chance, and we stand before God. We haven't trusted Christ. You're going to face God as a judge, and he's going to say, guilty, depart from me. I never knew you. But those of us who've trusted Christ, we're dead to the law now because we died in Christ. That was all chapter 6. The law is dead to believers. That's position number one in my second point here, Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, because of the example I just gave you in verses 1 through 3, ye also are dead to the law, how? By the body of Christ. Amen? That ye should be married, he goes back to marriage here just for a second. You're married to another. Who? We're the bride of Christ. Even to him who's raised from the dead, Jesus, we should bring forth fruit unto God. 
So the first position of the law is the glorious truth. The law is dead. It has no effect on us. Our sins were paid for. We don't have to pay for our sins. The penalty has been paid, all right? It's been done, and we're free from it. Believers are dead to the law. The law is bound to be dead to us. <laughs> Listen, the law has no power, no rule, no authority, no dominion over a true believer. The law is dead. It's a dead issue to the believer. It has nothing to do with us. The believer is dead to the law, and the law is dead to us. The law simply doesn't exist for the believer. You say, well, wait a minute. We have the Ten Commandments. I know that. But we're not going to have to go and, and face uh, God in heaven and say, well, you broke the law. You have to go to hell. Wait, I trusted Christ. I've died with him. I was crucified with Christ. My sins were nailed to the cross. You don't have to pay. The, the law has no power over us. When it comes to salvation and eternal life. And this is a shock to most people, but this is what the scripture is declaring. The amazing truth here is that a believer, again, a true believer that's trusted Christ by faith, is no longer under the law. Its accusing finger has changed us. We are new creations, we've been transformed. We no longer live under the law's shame and guilt. Why? Having broken it under its the tension of trying to keep it, its condemnation, its punishment, eternal separation from God, a discouragement, frustration. I don't know about you. I know people that believe you have to, you're saved by faith and works. Like you have to keep your salvation. Like God leaves you on this earth and you're on your own and you got to do all these things to keep your salvation. And they're, they're miserable. You know why? Because just like you can't gain salvation by keeping the law, you can't, even, you can't keep it. We're saved by grace. We're God's children. We cannot unbecome God's children. Although we believe salvation is eternal, everlasting. I don't even like to use the term because it's not a biblical word. Once saved, always saved. People say that, but it's, it's not a Bible term. It's eternal, everlasting. That's a Bible word, amen? And it's stronger than our words. No more failure, unworthy, disappointment. We're free. We're free from all those things that go with people that try to keep the law. First, this truth is a reality in your lives. The believer is dead to the law. We're crucified with Christ. We've put that to death in Christ. It's as if we were on the cross with Christ, all right? We haven't practically done that, but we say this positionally. God sees us as that way. Our death in Christ is called a vicarious. You know what vicarious means? Some people always say this about fathers. The father tries to live vicariously through the son. You know, the kid goes out for Little League, and he, maybe he's not as good as the dad was, so the dad's always trying to, do this, do that. I want you to hit a home run for me because I didn't do it when I was your age. You know, and you live, and it's the wrong thing to do. But this is a good way. We live vicariously through Jesus' death. He doesn't die. We don't die. We don't go to the cross, but we participate in the death of Christ spiritually. It's as if we were crucified with Christ. When a, when a person trusts in Christ's death, God takes our faith, and remember that word reckon? He counts it as having died in Christ. The other part of it is we've also been raised with him, but you have to see this death, that we're dead to the law. God counts the death of Christ as the death of the believer. God considers us, folks, to have been in Christ when Christ died. Why? Why does God do this? Because Christ died in our place. All right? He died and took the penalty, the payment for our sin, our, our punishment that we deserve because of the law. He took it on himself. So the believer being dead in Christ is freed freed from the law, from its demands, from its guilt, from its penalty, from its punishment. <laughs> How? How are we freed? By the body of Christ. Several things here real quick. Christ redeemed, bought us back from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. He took our place. On Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not, in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Nobody could. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. He took our place, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. You know those verses. So Christ freed us by his body. 
by being, being made free, by being a curse for us. Secondly, he redeemed us from the law by his blood, by his precious blood. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. With the penalty's gone. The, the stain, the power of sin and the law of us is gone. It's been removed by him being made a curse for us, by his precious blood, by even his body, as it says here, in Romans chapter 7, Ephesians 2.15 says, having abolished in his flesh, in his body, the enmity, the separation, even the law of the commandments, the law contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. We've been made, we have had peace, we have reconciliation uh, with God because of what Jesus did by his taking the curse for us, taking our place by his precious blood that he shed, all right, by his body. We have the Lord's Supper occasionally. We haven't had it in a while. I can't wait maybe someday till we do that again. We use these elements that are just symbols. The bread, the unleavened bread, again, broken, like his body was broken for us, and his blood, juice that we use, just representing his blood that was shed. And then Christ redeemed, lastly, the believer from the law by the cross. By the cross. By his death. Ephesians 2.16 says that he might reconcile, bring us together both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. He, he put to death this separation that there was because of sin between us and God. And he, we're free from the law. We're not under its penalty and its punishment. These are all equivalent expressions that we just went through. I teach the same truth. Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He tasted death for every man, every person, in other words, that comes to him. He suffered and satisfied God's justice, God's perfect justice. His death made us acceptable unto God and delivered us from what? The penalty of the law. What's the penalty of the law? Death. Not just physical. Eternal death. The second death. Eternal separation from God. So we're free Aren't you glad? We live in a supposedly, <laughs> until now, free country. America. We're going to start our own country. We're going to cut up a few blocks here. We're going to, what can we call? We've got to come up with a good name, not Chaz or Chomp. There's one Italian comedian. He said, I'm going to go start my own Italian country called Juch. We used to say Juch is like a slang term for a guy. He's a big Juch, you know? And uh, Christopher Columbus statues, bring them all over here. We'll take them here into this little Italian area called Chooch. Uh, police are honored here. We don't disrespect the police. We stand for the flag here in this nation of Chooch. This is what the, the comedian said. So we have to start our own uh, Bethel Bible Church. I don't know, we'll come up with something. <laughs> you can come in here. Everything's nice. Everybody loves each other. Maybe if we're all together in one place for a while, we can give hugs. I don't know. All right, first thing we said, this glorious truth, the law is dead. Let me get off of that quick. To believers, meatballs and chicken parmesan free in the land of whatever, whatever name we come up with, becomes a reality in the life of a person that's saved. We're free in the body of Christ. Isn't that a good thing? We love freedom, right, in our, in our country, but freedom has law and rules. Without it, you have what? What they have now in some places, anarchy. Everybody does that which is right in their own minds. Not good. Do you know they want to ban the police in several areas? They've already voted to do it. Not good. Not good. I love law enforcement. I hope you do as well. Note the glorious purpose of the believer's death. There's a reason. It's not just to say, we're free from the penalty of sin and trying to keep the law. We're free in Christ. But the believer dies to the law so he can be free to serve the Lord. Amen? It's the picture of marriage again. Before coming to Christ, we were married to the law. And you know what? Nobody could keep it. We were under its rule, under its authority. You know what the sentence was going to be for us when we faced God? Guilty! <laughs> Separated from God forever. Since coming to Christ, we are now married and united to Him and what He did. We're under His rule, His authority, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A perfect... Someday in this earth, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Not going to be like this. I can't wait for that. The believer that's saved, again, no longer lives 
as the law says, but as Christ lived and commanded. We have commands. We have the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what we're under now. We're under grace. Believers are married to Christ, the risen and living Lord. I serve a risen Savior, the song goes. He's in the world today. The marriage is a living, active marriage. We are called what? The bride of Christ. <laughs> I'm kidding around. I'm saying that's the only like, feminine thing. I'm, I'm a bride. <laughs> you have a husband, you have the husband and the wife, the bride and the groom, but we're not the groom. Jesus is the groom. We are the bride of Christ, both men and women that are saved. Here's the thing. The believer dies to the law. Why? Just to say we're free? No, so we can bear fruit unto God, it says there at the end of verse 4. Look at it again. You're also becoming dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another. Who? Even to him who's raised from the dead, Jesus, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. The fruit of a, uh, we, we just planted some parsley. We've got a little tomato plant. Terry likes to plant things, but if it's up to me, I, have, I don't have a green thumb. I have a brown thumb. We say everything dies. But we're trying to water it and got plant food, you know. Hopefully, I don't know, we'll see. I, I don't have... I don't have faith that it's going to work out, especially Terry's home from school now, so she has a little extra time to look after. Once she goes back to school, I don't know about those tomato plants, but right now we have a couple of little green tomatoes popped out, took a picture of it, and you know, on the camera, the, the thing is very tiny. It looks like, uh, I don't know, a, 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 it's kind of like what? A pea, the size of a pea, green. But hopefully it comes big and red, nice beefsteak tomato. But when you get the camera up close, <laughs> it looks like it's this big. But it's, it's tiny, like a pea-sized thing. The tree of a the tomato plant brings forth tomatoes, right? Apple tree, apples, orange tree, orange. The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. We're to bring forth fruit unto God. It could be several things. The fruit of righteousness. In other words, uh, we're, we're saved. We're born again. We're not under the law and the penalty. We're free. Not free to sin, as Paul said, God forbid. We're dead to sin. How should we live any longer therein? The fruit of righteousness. We're, we're, we're showing and demonstrating fruits of righteousness, which leads unto the Bible said in chapter 6, holiness. Holiness doesn't save us. It's a fruit of righteousness. Something comes after salvation, not in order to be saved, but because we are. We can also bear the fruit of another Christian. All right? Humans have human babies. Christians spiritually have spiritual new babes in Christ. How? by talking to people, by talking to people about the Lord, maybe giving a gospel tract, maybe telling them your testimony, like Paul did throughout the New Testament, how he was converted from a law-abiding Jew to now under the grace of God, right? Also bearing the fruit of the Spirit. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in our body temple. And in Galatians, we have a list there of not our fruit, but that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So all these things, when we die to the law, we bring forth fruit unto God. Number three, position number two. <laughs> you keeping up with me, uh, Fran? We don't have the bulletins here. I used to <laughs> Francis came to me and said, Pastor, why don't you put the uh, outline of your notes? Is it up there? Uh, I like to, I'm, I'm the person, Francis, that I like to keep. If I'm in a service, I keep notes on every point of the message. It just keeps me active, don't fall asleep, you know, and I'm make, keeping track. So uh, was that number two or number three? And so Francis said, it's good to have because sometimes you get lost with all these numbers and subpoints. This is point three, position two. <laughs> the law is alive. It's dead to those who are saved, but they're alive to the people that aren't saved, those that are in the flesh. That's verse five, Romans 7, 5. When we were, past tense, in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law. We wouldn't know sin if it wasn't for the law, Paul said. The law reveals our sinfulness. It worked in our members. What? The law did to bring forth fruit unto, not life, unto death, eternal death. A man, the natural man, without Christ, in the flesh, unsaved, not justified, not regenerated, lost. To be in the flesh means he's still under the law. He's still alive to the law. He's still married to the law, and he must keep it or suffer the guilt and the punishment and the spiritual death, but nobody could keep it. But people under the law think they have to try to keep it, and that's why they're miserable. Two things here on the point three, position two, two points. 
I'm sorry, I'm not trying to confuse you on purpose here. The law is alive and active to the person without Christ. It points out his or her sin. And not only that, the law arouses within a man guilt. Romans 3.20 says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. We had no knowledge of sin. Unless they put up a traffic light here, I didn't know I broke the law and went to a red light except for the law. Moreover, the law entered Romans 5.20 that the sin or the offense might abound. But we know grace much more abound. We know that. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? We're going to see this next week. Is the law sin? No. God forbid, he said. I had not known sin but by the law. I had not known lust except the law said, thou shalt not covet. The law, again, shows us our sinfulness. And then I love Galatians 3, 24. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we could see we can't keep it. We needed a Savior that we might be justified just as if I never sinned. By what? By faith, not by keeping the law. And so the law is alive and active. It arouses guilt. Second, it's alive and active. It arouses sinful passions. The law? The law. The passions of sin. That's why it says in, in verse 5, we were in the flesh, the motions, the motions, the passions of sins. The law not only points out our sinfulness, it arouses and stirs the emotions to do the forbidden. Sinful feelings are brought out by the law in our bodies, in our members. What the law prohibits and forbids, it actually creates within us. It's like telling the kid, don't put your finger in that plug. Why do they do that? Until they get zapped and they know they shouldn't have done it, right? It's the same with us. The law prohibits, it creates with us an interest. <laughs> Inquiring minds would want to know. It creates a tug, a fascination, an appeal, an arousal. Yes, that's what it says here. Say that's what Pastor Cool. No, that's what the Bible says, all right? This is the lost person now. There's within humans uh, something that makes us do what we're forbidden to do. Why do you think there's so much crime and lawlessness? When we're restricted and fenced in, we want to break through the restrictions, like telling the kids, can't do this, can't do that. They try, all right, so if I can't do this, they start drawing lines then. All right, you mean I can go right to that point? No, you shouldn't even go near sin, because the closer you get, the more likely you're going to fall into it. That's what we want to do in our flesh. We're under the law. Romans 7, 8 says, but sin taking occasion by the commandment, by its own self, by the law, wrought within me all manner of consupiscence, all manner of lusts, the law. For without the law, sin was dead, but no, it's made alive to the law, made us aware of what it is. The result of combating the law or refusing to obey the law is that one that bears the fruit of that sin. When a man violates the law, he bears the fruit of it, the transgression, the result. What sin lead to? Death, spiritual and physical. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the verse I always use when I try to talk to someone about the Lord, I always start with Romans 5, 12. You've got to get them lost before you get them saved, right? Wherefore, as by one man, where did it come from? We always tell them, the first human being, messed up, Adam. By one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It's logical even to unsaved people. Look, we're all going to die, right? This is why. Whether they believe it or not, this is why. James, I love James chapter 1. It gives us a progression of what sin does. When we're, again, not saved, we're under the sin, we're under the law. Lust, when it has conceived, brings forth sin. It starts with the mind, lust. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And then we go out and it, it conceives. Lust has a baby, yes. It's called sin. We actually do the act that we've been thinking about in our minds. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Sin is always a bad result. The end result of sin, always bad. The ultimate is death physically and then, of course, death spiritually. That's what it's talking about here. Wages of sin is death, spiritual and physical. The gift of God is what? Eternal life, on the other hand. We're not guaranteed eternal physical life, all right? Because of sin, we are going to die. But physical and spiritual, both death, but eternal life. We're going to still die physically, but we have... If you've died, if you've been born once, you have a physical birth, your birthday you celebrate, you'll die twice. You'll die physically and spiritually. But if you've been born twice, you have a spiritual birth, you'll die only once. That's the good news. 
My last point. Hey, we're doing pretty good here. Two minutes. I'll try to keep it under, under two minutes. The law is, and here's the good news, inactivated by conversion. Verse 6, last verse here, Romans 7, 6. But now we are delivered, I like being delivered, from the law, that being dead wherein we were held at one point, before we were saved, we were held to it like a captive, that we should serve now in newness, newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the law. Believers are delivered. That means we've been discharged from the law. How? By the, their death in Christ. We died with him. The believer's free. So we might serve now in the newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Sometimes you'll see that said in the Bible. The oldness of the letter refers to the law. <laughs> it's the written law which man tries to keep to gain favor with God, but the law was the old way to try and live. It's no longer the way for a man or woman to approach God. The newness of the Spirit, he says there in verse 6, refers to two things. Uh, whenever I study the Bible, I, I look sometimes at commentators that uh, have a lot more knowledge than I do about the Bible that have looked at, is this newness of the Spirit referring to the newness of God's Holy Spirit or the believer's new spirit? We believe it's both. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the capital O-N-E, the one who brings new life to the believer and bears fruit, the fruit of the Spirit within the believer. But the believer, new spirit, we're spiritually born. We have a body and a soul when we're born, but we're spiritually dead. When you get saved, you have three now, body, soul, and spirit. The soul is referred to sometimes as the heart in the Bible. We're individual souls, but we're spiritually dead without Christ. We're a soul that's going to live forever. There's souls that are dead spiritually going to live forever in hell. There's us, we've been born again, we have body, soul, and spirit. We're going to have eternal life in heaven with Christ. You've got to understand the difference between the soul and the spirit. We believe he's talking about the newness of the spirit here, of a born, again, Christian filled with God's Holy Spirit, but also a new spirit within us. It's focused, that new spirit, upon God. We can understand God's word. The natural man, the unsaved, can't understand things that are spiritual, the Bible says in Corinthians. What? Foolishness. I used to read the Bible before I get saved, and I'd read, and I'd read, and I'm like, I'm going to close the Bible. I don't, I don't understand. I have no idea what I'm reading here. Some idea, but not, not like you have now. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and 16, the Comforter is going to reveal truth to you. He's your teacher, your inner teacher of God's Word. And so our new spirit is focused now, not like the old, by trying to keep the law, but by bearing fruit by a relationship, and we talked about that in our Sunday school with Brother Blackaby, remember? Experiencing God now is a different meaning to life. The believer is a child of God, a member of God's family. We have access to God that we can boldly come in prayer. Different relationship. The believer seeks to serve God knowing if we fail once we're saved, God will forgive us and allow us to continue on. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sin. Why? Where's, where's child? If my son and my daughter did something wrong, that doesn't make them not my children anymore. I may be upset with them. We may fall out in our relationship, but they never can unbecome my child. Same thing with God. The believer no longer serves God in a legal, according to the law, that, that we're doomed and we're discouraged and we're defeated and we can't do it. We can't keep these laws. But we are free now. We serve God in a new spirit, amen, of love, joy, peace, forgiveness, and acceptance. It's nice to be accepted in the beloved. I'll finish with 2 Corinthians 5, 17, one of my favorite verses. I quote it a lot. Therefore, if any man, any woman, anyone, any human be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, Behold, all things are become new. Let me ask you a quick question. I'm done. Have you been freed from the law? We are free people as Christians. We know that. We're a free nation, right? We have freedoms that people take advantage of. I know that. But we need to be free from the law. What the law says, guilty deserve to go to hell. Why? God's a holy God, and we're unholy people. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins so we can have eternal life. But not only that, I, I love studying about salvation. It almost makes me feel like I want to go back and get saved again. But you know what? You don't have to. 
just like children have to learn, we, we learn about our salvation after we're saved. We're saved just by simple childlike faith. But the thing is, now that we study God's Word, we learn so much more about what happened, what really happened when we got saved, what took place. It's unbelievable, all right? God sees us just as if we never sinned. I don't understand that. But that's the only way we can get to heaven. Now Paul's writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost how to live the Christian life in victory. You're dead to sin. We've been crucified with Christ. We're dead to the law. Why? Like we can't keep it even if we try. And there are people that are miserable trying to keep the law. We don't do good things in order to get saved. We do them because we are. We want to have fruit unto righteousness, unto holiness. God says in his word, be ye holy, for I am holy. Not in order to get saved. We could keep all the laws we want. Nobody could anyway. Jesus, only one. He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it, but we can't. He was virgin born, sinless son of God. Only he. In Revelation, I like where it says that there was a scroll and there was no one they could find worthy to open the scroll except Jesus. Amen? Only Jesus. <laughs> I'm thinking of songs all the time when I say these words could do what he did so we can have the free gift, not by keeping the law, but by grace, freely bestowed. By grace are you saved through faith. The object, not your faith, the object of your faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. We're not going to go to heaven saying, boy, I kept the law, I've been a good boy. <laughs> no, when the lady told me I'm a sinner, I, I, first thing I said, nah, I'm fine. You're going to go to heaven? Yeah. Why? All right. Husband, father, hard-working guy. You're a sinner, she said. This lady, Darlene. And I thought to myself, that's like she's putting me down. But she really wasn't. She was a very loving woman. I didn't see it. I had that human male pride thing. Yeah, I deserve to go to heaven. Where are you going to go when you die? I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Like Catholic, you know. Bah, bah, bah. And she led us to verses in the Bible that showed us our sinfulness. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a sinner, yes. <laughs> I deserve to die and go to hell. Do you want to go to hell? No. And it's like, it's kind of silly because it's, the gospel is really very simple. And we prayed by faith, July 8, 1982, trusted Christ, was born again. And like Paul, could you imagine when Paul got saved? He was a Jew, very knowledgeable Jew under Gamaliel, uh, knew, understood the Old Testament inside and out. And then when he trusted Christ on the road to Damascus, it must have been like a, not just a light bulb, but like a, an unbelievable flash of lightning in his heart and mind. That Jesus of Nazareth, he's the one. He's the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for and studying about all these years. He was probably just like other trying to keep the law of people, miserable. And when he found Christ, he was freed. Freed. What did he do, man? Soon as he got saved, he didn't go to Bible college. He didn't need to anyway. He knew all the Old Testament. But you know what I'm saying? He went out right away to the synagogue, to his what? His fellow Jews. Because they knew what he knew. And he was trying to win them to Christ. And a lot of them got saved. The first Christians were Jews. What happened to the majority, the nation of Israel, you could say as a whole, rejected Christ. And then they went to, thank the Lord, Gentiles. That's most of us, right? The gospel to the world. If you're here this morning, you trusted Christ, amen. Amen, right? Are you happy you're saved today? Amen. Free from the law. Oh, happy condition. The song goes. Look at when you get home, the chapter, those first six verses. Seven times the law is mentioned. The law is not a bad thing, because if it brought us to Christ, it's a good thing. But we just, it's not good to say, I'm going to use the law to be saved. No, then it becomes a bad thing, because no one can keep it. Thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy, his long-suffering, and for salvation. Brother John's going to come in a moment. We're going to sing a hymn. We want you to sing with us and think about your own heart. Most of you I know are born again. You're saved. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ, do it today. Think about what God wants you to do, to be doers of the word, not hearers only. All right, Brother John, you can come. We'll sing, and then we'll have a closing prayer. We love you folks, and uh, we pray for you all the time. God bless you.